Who was behind the mask of the famous Grievers? Why was a perfectly scary VFX version of the Cranks removed from the movie? And how did the production team build 800 skyscrapers for the death cure? Hi, Maze Runner lovers. Time to break down the movie's epic CGI magic. Enlivening the Grievers. One of the key challenges for the VFX team was bringing the Grievers to life, menacing part mechanical creatures that emerge at night to patrol the labyrinth. Grievers, as scary as hell, horrible looking things. These eyes. Even though it was extremely complicated, the whole team loved the process, spending loads of time recreating those scary things. The director commented, I wanted to try to do the best we could to capture sort of what James Dashner described in the book, but I wanted to go really freaking scary. The concept of the Grievers went through a number of stages of design development. Visual artists started by looking at macro photos of bed bugs and fleas. The supervisor Sue Rowe shared, I always find that whatever crazy creature you want to create, nature has already done it for you somewhere. We studied how ants move and looked at slugs for the organic soft parts of the body. We used whatever grossed me out for the textures, like a slug's skin with warts from a frog. Actually, real-world research informed not only the way the Grievers looked, but also how they moved. One day, while the creators were researching, there was some major construction going on outside of the office window. They laughed at the pneumatic crane and drills outside and suddenly thought, those look exactly like the Grievers' legs. Even though the creation of the Griever models was totally digital, including numerous visual tools like ZBrush, Mudbox, and Mari, on set, someone still had to imitate them. First, when I came here, I saw two guys in blue suits. I thought I was coming to like the Swan Lake performance, but uh, no, they're actually the Grievers. So you'll see guys dressed in all blue suits to match the screens, and they're the Grievers. <laughs> The presence of those stunt people in blue not only helped the VFX team to create the movement in post-production, but also really helped the actors act out their emotions, because something really was chasing them while the cameras rolled. Hey, what's up? My name is Greg. I am uh, one of the stunt performers here on The Maze Runner, and uh, I'm standing in as one of the grievers. Well, I bet running away from Greg felt much better for the cast than running away from an actual tech monster. In the end, it took the team more than nine weeks to create the first working model. Dylan O'Brien was especially excited to see the result because he spent so much of the movie running from a guy in a blue suit. Now, talking about real dangerous creatures on set, no VFX required. Well, while most of the dangerous creatures were created artificially, in real life, filming in an open space green location always means expecting hellos from the nearby wildlife. The mandatory rule on set was that everyone had to wear snake-proof boots. They also had a snake handler on location to clear all dangerous snakes and creepy crawlies away from the set. Sue Rowe shared, On the last day of the shoot, I put a plastic snake in the briefcase of my producer, Scott Puckett. He didn't find it until he was back in his hotel. He freaked. He'll get me back someday. Day, but it was worth it. Another unexpected issue was ubiquitous clouds of insects. Those did, however, provide some creative inspiration for the director. Once the team saw flying bugs everywhere on location, they decided to add digital bugs to the final shots to get some additional movement on screen. Mysteriously deceased. Of course, Grievers were not the only creepy creatures that were created with the help of CGI. Remember the Cranks? Those disgusting zombies who were infected with the flare, a plague brought on from the solar flare activity. Can you imagine the work involved doing makeup for an army of zombies that chase the main characters? So, of course, the team decided to use visual effects instead. Although the lesser infected souls above ground were basically done with physical makeup by ADI, the really evil Cranks below were fully CGI motion captured with double-jointed circus actors providing the motion. If you ever wondered what the inspiration for the creation of this horrible disease was, there is actually a real illness that creators use as a visual reference for the VFX. They were then modeled with a cross between some kind of vine-like vegetation and a horrendous real disease that Chris White found online called subcutaneous horn. And trust me, do not Google images of that. Oh, creepy. However, the VFX team did a great job with those guys. But if you think that the ones we saw in the movie were scary, then I should probably tell you that there was a version of the Cranks that was too repulsive even for the creators. And thankfully, audiences were spared from seeing that version on the big screen, as the team decided to pull back just enough to stop the film turning into a full-on horror. Rebuilding Cape Town 
You must remember that high-tech city in the last movie, the one where Thomas and co. looked to infiltrate the main WCKD skyscraper. You might think that the whole city was created with post-production tools, but in reality, most of the scenes were filmed in Cape Town. Be honest, did you recognize the city after Weta Digital's modifications? The production team thought Cape Town didn't look futuristic enough for the film, and its slums were too uniform for the look they had in mind. Chris White, Weta Digital visual effects supervisor, shared, It was quite a big build. Some parts of the slums outside the city had over a million buildings, and we had 800 hand-placed buildings inside the city. We went big on parallax. Working from footage shots in various locations in Cape Town and the 3D map of that city, the crew basically inserted their own futuristic buildings or updated existing ones into something more impressive. White described the process as, Sometimes we replaced areas with all CG buildings, but it wasn't arbitrary. The layout artists would match up with the plates. If we had shot on a certain street, they would have set up our CG city to correspond. If the actors crossed over to another street, it would align with our 3D city. We always had to be aware of where we were. For the slums, the crew imagined that people had set up shacks while waiting and trying to get into the main city. While VFX, they dressed them so that the shacks looked hand-built, and then duplicated them to make the area look massive. Populating the dead city. Imagine artificially adding 800 buildings to the city. Without any life inside, they'd easily turn any place into a ghost town. So the studio spent significant effort in ensuring the inside areas of the buildings, especially office towers, had extra life. Most shots in the city take place at night, so to enhance the images, the Weta crew decided to fully furnish all the rooms seen through the building windows with CG models, which was pretty different from their normal way of doing things. White commented, Before, we might have used images projected into the rooms, but for this film, we placed CG furniture, desks, real light fixtures with bulbs, and so forth. We wondered whether we needed to dress all 800 buildings, but once we did, we saw that it looked really good. Can you believe they even wrote special software so the technical directors could adjust the temperature of the lights and turn them on and off? Astonishing! Faking the legendary escape. Not really. Nice pep talk. Yeah, bloody inspired. You must remember that trademark city shot of the boys high up inside the WCKD building, smashing a window and jumping into a water feature below. The camera follows them through the window as they make the leap, and the whole city vista can be seen in the background. White shared that this scene in particular was one of his personal favorites. He revealed that it was shot on a stage and the actors did jump out of a window, but in comparison to the final piece, of course, the drop was not very far onto mats. Then we did a handover to our digital doubles for the three guys, and as they're coming out the window, and then we follow them all the way down. The Flying Bus Meanwhile, as the boys took their leap of faith, Brenda commanded a bus to rescue several gladers who had been kept prisoners by WCKD. Parts of the scene were filmed in a dry dock in Cape Town, which resembled parts of the wall around the city, and had the desired combination of a concrete and metal look. Weta Digital filled in the surroundings with buildings, slum areas, and their CG wall. The practical shoot also had an unexpected funny story that led to a perfect bonus result for the sequence. The onset supervisor said when they practically dropped the bus, Wes, the director, thought it would be great if the out-of-service light went on when the bus fell, so that would be a great gag. But the crew looked at it, and there was no way that they could actually rig it, because it was just a little switch, and so they said it was impossible to accomplish. But then, by happenstance, when they dropped the bus, a piece of it fell and hit that switch at just the right time to put the out-of-service light on, exactly as the director imagined it. Basically, this perfect luck played as a great gag, and the audience absolutely loved it. If you enjoyed this video, we have even more exciting content like this on our channel. Go check it out! Thanks for watching, subscribe, and as always, stay awesome!